All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dave Abrams. I'm the Director of Communications for the Maryland Department of the Environment. And I just want to thank you all for joining us tonight. This is the first of four outreach sessions where we are going to talk about our Building Energy Performance Standards, also known as BEPS. And so starting tonight, we're going to give you an overview of our regulations and how to come into a compliance. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, just a few programming notes. You can submit questions via the Q&A and we will certainly get to your questions. If you would uh, bear with us, we're gonna give you a presentation first, an overview, and then we will take questions at the end and hopefully we'll have plenty of time to answer everybody's questions. So uh, feel free to drop a question in the chat whenever you want and we will get to those right after the presentation. So just a uh, quick overview of what we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, these are our friendly emojis, Dr. Decarb and, and Miss Price. And um, you're going to meet Dr. Decarb in the flesh um, later on in the program. Uh, his name is Dr. Zach Berzola, and he's an expert on um, the building regulations and also the technology behind um, energy efficient products. We're going to give you an overview of the building regulations, um, and we're going to give you some tips on, on how to get started and, and start making our way toward energy efficiency. Uh, we'll also talk about benchmarking, compliance, and uh, at the end, we'll provide some resources where you can get more information. So like I said, we're gonna have four sessions. Today is the first one, how to get started decarbonizing large buildings. On August 13th, we're gonna devote the entire hour to answering questions from Dr. Decarb. There he is there at the bottom right. And on August 22nd, clean buildings for all, leaving no one behind. We're going to focus there on, you know, as we build the green economy, how do we make sure everyone participates and everyone benefits from energy efficiency and good indoor air quality and outdoor air quality. And then on September 10th, we have um, our benchmarking and reporting working group. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our outreach coordinator for building energy performance standards, Sam Furio. Sam? Thanks, Dave. Uh, can you hear me all right? Gotcha. All right. Uh, well, thank you everybody for being here this evening. Uh, I know uh, seven o'clock is tough after long work day, uh, but we appreciate the flexibility and you joining in with us. Um, as Dave mentioned, um, my name is Sam Furio. I'm the outreach coordinator for the Maryland Department of the Environment's Building Decarbonization Team. Um, our team is responsible for developing and implementing the proposed building energy performance standards known as BEPS. Um, and just wanted to make a point again that if you have any uh, questions during this presentation, feel free to submit them in the Q&A feature uh, at the bottom right of the screen. It's a little triangle square circle um, button, uh, and you click on that, you can go to Q and A, um, and this session is also being recorded. Uh, so if you miss anything, um, this will uh, be up on the BEPS YouTube playlist. Um, but, uh, as, as Dave mentioned, we're, we're kicking off some new series here. Um, this month, uh, Dr. Decarb diagnoses and prescribes, um, his Dr. Decarb's webinar series starts on August 13th. Um, and, and, and Dr. Decarb and our building decarbonization team will help you better understand how to comply with the BEPS regulations. Uh, you can sign up today for our newsletter to receive resources and helpful tips. Uh, next slide. Um, and then also, as Dave mentioned, uh, Ms. Price from Maryland Energy, Maryland Energy Administration uh, is launching her webinar series on August 22nd at 7 p.m. Um, Ms. Price is here to help you get the resources you need to decarbonize your buildings. Um, so you can sign up today uh, for the Clean Buildings for All webinar and also the Clean Buildings Hub newsletter. Uh, and we will plan to get into the Clean Buildings Hub um, later in this call. Um, and we're going to be spamming you with a ton of links tonight. So um, feel free to see them in the, in the chat. Uh, Zach Rizzola is dropping in them, them in there for you. So 
Um, next slide, please. All right, so uh, let's get started uh, with, with some uh, background on BEPS this evening. Um, so building energy performance standards and other types of building decarbonization policies are popping up around the country. Um, but the Maryland BEPS story officially began in 2022 when the Climate Solutions Now Act was passed, uh, which requires the Maryland Department of the Environment uh, to implement and develop BEPS. Uh, and BEPS is a key part of fulfilling the state's greenhouse gas reduction goals. Uh, you can learn more about BEPS and other proposed greenhouse gas reduction policies in the Climate Pollution Reduction Plan. Um, and I think Zach's dropping that in the chat for you as well, that you can find that on MDE's website today. It's a very light 98 pages, so you might be able to finish that in the morning with your coffee. Um, but that plan shows the pathway toward meeting the state's greenhouse gas reduction goals of 60% by 2031 and net zero by 2045 compared to 2006 levels. Uh, and just quickly to define net zero, net zero means there's a balance between how much greenhouse gases are added to the air and how much is taken away. Um, so next slide, please. <clears throat> and so just a high level overview of the proposed BEPS regulations, uh, again, required by the Climate Solutions Now Act of 2022. Um, the proposed BEPS in Maryland requires buildings larger than 35,000 square feet to meet certain requirements, including energy data reporting and emissions reductions. Building owners must start annually reporting energy use data on June 1, 2025. Building owners must meet interim standards starting annually in 2030 and reach a final standard of zero net direct emissions by 2040. When, these proposed, or when those proposed emission standards come into effect, building owners can make an alternative compliance payment in lieu of fully achieving the emission standards. And I'll just add quickly here that uh, based on preliminary analysis, the covered building stock in Maryland, uh, or a third of the covered building stock in Maryland already meets the emission standards. So we'll go on and we'll start to visualize where we are in the development of these proposed BEPs. Next slide. <clears throat> so this is a timeline that recaps the history of Maryland's BEPs, shows what's to come, and highlights where we are now being the summer of 2024. Uh, so as I said, we began this process uh, with the Climate Solutions Now Act of 2022. Uh, MDE proposed a BEPS regulation in 2023 and held a public comment period and hearing in 2024. That version had two standards for building owners to achieve an emission standard and an energy use intensity standard or an EUI. Uh, the emission standard is intended to reduce on-site GHG emissions from covered buildings, and the EUI is intended to improve the efficiency of the building. And I want to emphasize that the emission standards only include the emissions from the building itself, not the emissions from the grid energy supplied to the building. The only caveat being if the building is connected to a district energy system, which is not common. In the spring of 2024, a budget bill amendment during the legislative session required the department to withdraw the energy use intensity standard uh, for further analysis. Um, and then this summer, on July 15th, MDE released the new 2024 draft BEPS regulation. Uh, MDE aims to propose this BEPS regulation this fall and formally adopt it before the end of the year. Uh, the EUI standard, that efficiency standard, has been removed per the budgetary requirement and the emission standard remains. Uh, the reporting requirement also stays the same between the versions in that the owners of buildings covered by the regulation must report 2024 calendar year energy use data to MDE by June 1, 2025. And for more information, uh, see the press release uh, that the MDE just released a few weeks ago, and uh, you can see that in the chat now. So next slide, please. So let's get into some of the specifics on the proposed uh, building energy performance standards. So uh, buildings covered under BEPS, just reiterating that a, a covered building in Maryland BEPS is a building that has a gross floor area of 35,000 square feet or more, excluding the parking garage area. Um, and so on this chart in front of you, you can see 
uh, based on preliminary analysis, there are over 9,000 covered buildings in the state of Maryland. Um, and that preliminary covered building stock is broken down in this chart into uh, specific property types. Um, and you can see a large majority of the covered building stock in Maryland are warehouses and housing, um, and also uh, office spaces and retail stores. Next slide, please. So based off that same preliminary analysis, we can uh, map the location of these covered buildings across the state. Um, and so uh, you can see that there are covered buildings uh, spread across the state of Maryland and located in every county. Um, but as you can see, the majority of covered buildings within the state are located along the I-95 corridor between Baltimore and DC. Uh, the covered building stock does include certain exemptions, meaning that there are certain circumstances where a building owner or a building greater than 35,000 square feet does not need to comply with BEPS. Um, those exemptions would be, uh, next slide. Uh, historic buildings and spaces that are individually designated as historic property under law, public or non-public elementary and secondary school buildings, manufacturing buildings, agricultural buildings, and federally owned buildings. Uh, our building decarbonization team is developing exemption request forms and its corresponding process. Uh, they will be available on the BEPS website. Um, and we will thoroughly evaluate each exemption request. Next slide, please. So continuing with this exemption, exemption theme, uh, when a covered building owner submits energy use to the department, uh, there are certain types of energy uses that can be excluded, such as food service facilities engaging in commercial cooking and water heating, electric vehicle charging, emissions from required combustion equipment if a federal or state regulation requires it, uh, and other miscellaneous energy uses, uh, for example, uh, cell towers, um, and you can find these other miscellaneous uses in the regulations technical memorandum um, online. Uh, so next slide, please. So those are some of the, the basics on, on BEPS covered buildings. Um, what does a building owner need to do? Uh, first things first, a building owner needs to determine if a building is covered under BEPS by calculating its square footage or evaluating its exemption status. Uh, remember, buildings with less than 35,000 square feet do not need to comply with the BEPS regulation. Buildings larger than 35,000 square feet are required to comply. And I'll make a quick note here. If a building is smaller than 35,000 square feet, the owner of that building does not need to submit an exemption form to the department. The department only needs exemption forms from buildings that are greater than 35,000 square feet that fall into one of the exemption buckets that I mentioned previously. Next, a uh, building owner should start benchmarking, which means to measure your building's performance. Uh, right now, the most important step for a covered building is benchmarking and getting ready to benchmark. And it's okay if you're unsure about it. Uh, we want to be really clear in what that looks like. Uh, so the department will host a benchmarking and reporting working group on September 10th at 1 p.m. Uh, to get the ball rolling. Uh, you can sign up for that session via the same Google form you use to sign up for this session. Um, so once a building owner has benchmarked their building, uh, they will be able to assess whether the building is already achieving the proposed standards. Um, excuse me. And they can see where their building sits currently, energy performance-wise, and the standards they need to hit. If it isn't meeting these standards, building owners will need to plan to make improvements and if necessary, determine what is preferable to pay the alternative compliance payment. Uh, as I said previously, MDE intends to bring back the site EUI standard, uh, which focuses on efficiency. Uh, building owners should prioritize efficient electrification projects and are advised not to install electric resistance heating equipment without considering how using this equipment would influence the efficiency of their building and as a result, that site EUI number. Uh, so some examples of improvements a building owner can start thinking about now include, on the next slide, uh, conducting an energy audit. Uh, you can think of this like a physical for your building. Uh, you can install LED lighting. This is traditionally extremely low cost and a great early step in improving your building's performance. Uh, purchase Energy Star equipment. Look for that yellow Energy Star rating and logo to ensure what kind of power use your appliances will pull. Make weatherization improvements. 
uh, to the building and do a retro commissioning project to get your systems working together correctly. Also, you can install control systems for plug loads, lighting, and HVAC equipment to improve efficiency. So visually breaking down this process for compliance um, on the next slide. Um, so as I've said annually, starting in 2025, uh, building owners will begin benchmarking, measuring their building's performance. Uh, they will benchmark by using the Energy Star Portfolio Manager tool to track annual energy use and GHG emissions. You'll create a shell for your building by entering accurate property characteristics into the tool and then load in your energy data and the tool will display your building's performance. The tool is free and you can start practicing today. Energy Star has great free trainings online and we recommend taking advantage of them. Uh, we'll drop that link in the chat as well. Um, and at this point, it's, it's important to note that more than 4,000 buildings in the state of Maryland are already benchmarking their building's energy data. And uh, next point. So based on this information that Energy Star Portfolio Manager gives you, uh, building owners can start their assessment phase and determine based on their building's performance where they need to go to meet their property type's proposed standard. They can use those improvements I just mentioned during the assessment phase once they determine where their property sits in comparison to the targets. And then five years down the road, there's a long runway for building owners to assess their needs and make improvements starting in 2030. Building owners will need to annually achieve the proposed BEP standards or achieve partial compliance and make alternative compliance payments. And the standards they need to achieve will be interim standards. Building owners do not need to meet the net zero final standard until 2040. The interim standards are higher emissions limits. So with that, let's dive into the alternative compliance payment. Alternative compliance is available for the proposed net direct emission standard. They are payments set at the US Environmental Protection Agency's uh, social cost of greenhouse gas. These rates are the lowest permitted by law. Uh, so on the screen, you can see the alternative compliance payment cost per ton of GHG emissions over the standard for each year, starting when the standards take effect in 2030. First and foremost, a third of all covered buildings are already meeting the final standard, as I said. Uh, for those that aren't, the first interim performance standards, which don't take effect until 2030, allow for some emissions. Today, it's August of 2024, uh, so you have plenty of time to get to the first interim standards performance requirement and another 10 years after that to achieve net zero emissions annually. And that's a long runway to plan for retrofits. Uh, so let's look at 2030, uh, the second column. Here, the cost is $230. This means that if a building owner emits one metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent over their proposed standard, they will pay $230. Uh, so look at 2031, the third column. Um, notice that the cost is now $234. Um, excuse me. Uh, that's because the metric ton pricing increases by $4 per year and so on and so forth. All of these costs are in $2020 and are adjusted for inflation. MDE's job is to reduce pollution for all Marylanders. Uh, so our goal is for all buildings to achieve net zero direct emissions by 2040. Thus, we are committed to helping every building comply with the standards without needing to make an alternative compliance payment. But we understand that every building is unique and the alternative compliance payment is available to all building owners as a flexibility option to help them comply with the regulations however they see fit. Uh, next slide, please. So diving further into this payment, on the screen you, see, you now see is the compliance spectrum, uh, which represents a building owner's own decision-making process when determining cost-effective compliance with BEPS. Uh, on the far left of the spectrum, uh, you have what we view as undesirable, where the building owner is not currently meeting the standard and makes no improvements to their property. They opt to meet compliance by making an alternative compliance payment for the difference between the standard and their total emissions. On the opposite side of the spectrum, you have what the department views to be the ideal scenario where the building owner is already meeting or making improvements to meet the standard. Again, based on preliminary analysis, one third of buildings are already meeting the emissions standard. 
then somewhere in the middle, uh, the building owner is already nearly in compliance and are opts to make improvements to their property until they decide it is more cost effective to make an alternative compliance payment on the remaining missions, emissions over the proposed standard. Uh, so based on preliminary analysis, we are expecting many buildings to come into 95% compliance with the standards and then pay the alternative compliance payment for the last mile hardest to abate emissions. Uh, next slide, please. So here we have an example of a 40,000 square foot building's experience through the BEPS compliance process. On the x-axis, we have the timeline through the BEPS process broken down into four periods. Uh, the baseline and assessment phase from 2025 to 2029, the interim standard one phase from 2030 to 2034, the interim standard two phase from 2035 to 2039, and the final standard phase starting in 2040. Uh, on the y-axis, we have the building's net direct emissions and carbon dioxide equivalent per square foot. The building owner determines that a retro commissioning and an envelope improvement project will reduce their emissions to meet the interim standard one, and therefore, between 2030 and 2034, the building owner does not pay an alternative compliance payment. Starting in 2035, that interim standard two takes effect and the emissions requirement tightens. The building owner can see the target and opts to meet compliance for 2035, 2036, and 2037 by staying at their current emissions level and paying for their overage in the form of an alternative compliance payment. In 2035, as you can see on the screen, the building owner pays $1,000 for the entire year. Uh, in 2036, this amount becomes $1,016, and in 2037, it becomes $1,032. Uh, because the metric ton pricing that I showed you increases by $4 a year, as I said. Uh, in 2038, the building owner opts to make a full mechanical system replacement at the end of their system life, which reduces their net direct emissions to zero, coming into full compliance with the final standard uh, prior to 2040. Uh, so you can see a calculation for 2035's ACP at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you're interested, you can start assessing your performance today uh, compared to the proposed standards uh, by loading your old calendar year energy data, say from 2023, um, into your building profile. And next slide. Thank you. Uh, we understand that, you know, these improvements do cost money. Uh, so how can building owners fund these improvements? Uh, you can see some of the available resources on the screen uh, in Power Maryland, is a ratepayer funded utility incentive program that offers building tune-ups, equipment rebates, and training incentives. Uh, the Maryland Clean Energy Center is a statewide green bank uh, that offers financing and technical assistance for projects. Uh, Department of Housing and Community Development offers grants and loans for energy efficiency. Uh, there are also federal incentives offered through the Inflation Reduction Act and also additional low-cost financing offered through MD Property Assessed Clean Energy Loans, or MD PACE. Um, and the Maryland Energy Administration, or MEA, offers the Clean Building Sub, which I will dive into further, as well as a variety of grants, loans, and rebates. And next slide, please. Uh, so that Clean Building Sub that I mentioned uh, is within the Maryland Energy, Maryland Energy Administration. Uh, the Clean Building Sub is a one-stop shop clearinghouse of uh, relevant information and resources to help stakeholders reduce energy use and emissions of their buildings, such as federal, state, local, and utility incentives. Uh, the hub will amplify resources, peer learning networks, and educational programming. Uh, you can scan the QR code on the screen to visit the hub's website for more information. Uh, but just as important, please let us know if there are missing resources that would be useful to you and submit this feedback on the hub. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it back to Dave Abrams now to, to wrap this up and move us into uh, Q&A for the evening. Thanks, everyone. Great, thank you, Sam. Great overview, really appreciate that. Um, we can't let you go here into Q&A without a shameless plug for our social media. Uh, we're on all the platforms, uh, most of the platforms, and we'll be putting out a lot of information that is relevant to what you're hearing tonight. We'll have uh, 
all kinds of updates about uh, upcoming outreach sessions. We'll have tips on how to start the process of benchmarking and decarbonization and all kinds of other uh, good content uh, to help you along the way. Uh, of course, you have our website there and you can always reach us via email at beps.mde at maryland.gov or you can call us at 410-537-3183. So uh, that concludes our presentation. At this point, I would like to, uh, I, I should have brought a um, sound effect for this. I need a drum wall roll and I don't have one, but I will introduce you now to uh, Dr. D. Carve himself, Dr. Zach Berzola. If you could turn your camera on there, Zach. And um, Zach is gonna take some questions from the chat. So please start uh, submitting your questions. And let me see here. Let me go to the first one that I have. Um, Zach, can you, I, I think there were a lot of dates in there, a lot of time frames. When is when are people expected to submit benchmarking data? Yeah, absolutely, Dave. So the first benchmarking deadline is June first, twenty twenty five. So that's coming up uh, next calendar year for based on the count. Sorry, next year based on calendar year twenty twenty four data. So that's uh, coming up uh, not too far away, and that's why we're encouraging everyone to start thinking about benchmarking. And again, uh, shameless plug, we'll go into a lot more details about how to benchmark in that September 10th workshop, uh, working group session one, that'll be the first of several sessions on benchmarking and additional guidance for how to benchmark for MDE. And actually, Dave, I'm just going to answer another question that I think came in on the chat, which is specific to this, which is, will Maryland, uh, will we have a Maryland BEP specific Energy Star portfolio manager tool or page, or will the usual online portfolio manager tool be utilized? And the answer to that, again, more details to come, but we will use the standard Energy Star portfolio manager, and then you will share that data to MDE through the tool. And so that's that's how we're setting it up uh, to start now. So you'd enter it just like normal. In fact, if you're already one of those 4,000 buildings that are already benchmarking, all you're going to have to do is click a couple of buttons if you want to apply some of the exemptions that we allow for uh, in the state's regular uh, BEPS, we, you absolutely uh, can do that as well. Uh, so, you know, and, and then click a button, that's that. Then that's pretty much that. Uh, so for folks that are used to benchmarking, it should be pretty straightforward, but we're definitely looking forward to the a little bit more feedback uh, on streamlining that process uh, come September. And let me jump in here, Zach, as somebody who's not as well versed as maybe a lot of people on the call here, but I'm sure there are some. Can you walk us through, like, what does benchmarking entail? Like, what, what do I need to do to start benchmarking? Yeah, absolutely, Dave. So benchmarking is all about taking your energy use data and put, so, I mean, the, the high level is trying to understand how your building's performing they, at the end of the day. How is my building do, doing? We like to think, or I like to think about some of these, uh, about the net direct emissions as a key performance indicator. How is my building doing? And you might think in terms of energy, of cost expenditure on your utilities. You might think about it in terms of emissions. You might think about it in other ways. Uh, benchmarking is just a, a matter of checking in. Where, What am I doing today how, or last year? How did my building do? So what it really takes is a couple of key pieces of information about your building, the different uses going on. And so uh, we mentioned earlier a whole bunch of different property types that are common across Maryland. Uh, there's actually almost 90 different ones that are in the regulation. And you might have a little bit of two, two things in your building. You might have mostly an office, but you have you know, uh, a, 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 a pharmacy on the first floor, like a CVS or a Walgreens. And so these are the kind of, uh, you might have two different things and we have a way to combine those two together in, uh, in our benchmarking. But you put that information into the tool and then you put in your energy use. And that's just how much electricity, if you have, 
natural gas or fuel oil or propane, you'd put that in as well. And again, we'll go through the details in September, but the, the core idea is, okay, I enter my energy use, I say a little bit about my property, and then make sure it all looks good and, and, and hit submit. And, and that's basically just how the benchmarking side of this goes. And that process will repeat itself every year. And we're working with the utilities across the state to make the, the data for the energy use side pretty streamlined. Thank you, Dr. DeCarb. And uh, just to, a reminder to everyone on August 13th, that will be our next session. And uh, Zach will be taking just Q&A for the entire hour. So it'll give you some time to digest this presentation and look over the regs um, and, and any other questions you come up with. We'll have a little bit more time to uh, jump into the questions, but we have several here today. So let me, let me try another one for you here, Zach. Um, I have a question from... Um, Sorry, I'm, I forgot to check off on the other one that we already answered. We got to do that. Here, Dave, I'll grab one right off the bat uh, sure. while you're looking. So, uh, 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 Rosy asked, will a covered building list be published or will buildings need to determine uh, on their own whether they are subject to the benchmarking based on their primary use types and floor area? And and that's a great question. So, if the at a high level MDE, we plan to publish a covered buildings list and we have a draft one out right now from last year that you can go find on the website that has about 9,300 buildings on it. And that's our best attempt at a covered buildings list. Uh, but if you're not on that list and you are over the threshold and not exempt, you still are required to, to benchmark and meet the standards in the law in, under the regulation. And so this is the kind of thing where we have access to as be best the data as we can, and we're trying to help by, by laying this out. Uh, but if you're not on that list and you think you should be, uh, we'll have a form for that for you to submit and say, hey, I need to be on this list. And, and also the same goes, Sam mentioned earlier, you know, buildings uh, under 35,000 square feet, they don't need to apply for exemption. They're, we're just keeping them off. That being said, maybe maybe the data was wrong and we put a 35, you know, a 33,000 square foot building on that list. We'll have a form for that. And so you can submit and say, hey, I'm 33,000 square feet. I'm not covered. We'll take you off and, and, and that'll be done. Uh, and, and the same goes, you know, maybe an exempt building is on the list, but needs to get a, uh, taken off. Uh, those are all the kinds of things that we will be handling uh, down the line as we get into the uh, next year. Great. Uh, okay, I, I'll, I'll pitch the next one to you, Zach. It's uh, from Caitlin. She wants to know if you can get renewable energy credits to reach net zero. Um, if you have windmills on on top of your building or something cool like that. Yes, uh, this is a great question. And this is something we get asked a lot. And as Sam mentioned uh, very briefly at the beginning, the, the, the core standard that we're talking about today is all around net direct emissions. And that's from emissions coming out of your building or out of a district energy system you're connected to if you're one of the handful of cases in that uh, in that bucket. And so in that case, it's all about things being burned on site and not about electricity. And so the renewable energy credits are generally coming for electricity, for solar electricity, and so or, or wind or, or biogas generated electricity. And so those are the kinds of things that are not related to net direct emissions. And so those are not allowed to as part of reaching the uh, net zero direct emissions part of this regulation that we're talking about right now. Great, thank you. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and take an easy one because I can answer it myself without a specialized degree in, in science and engineering. Um, will the links in the slide deck be emailed to everyone who registered tonight? Uh, absolutely, we can do that for you. And uh, also, uh, as Sam mentioned, we have this new hub uh, newsletter that we're doing uh, in partnership with MEA, Maryland Energy Administration. Please sign up for that. We we put out our first edition, I believe it was last week or so. Um, I think it was last week. 
time flies when you're having fun um but we're going to keep those coming and uh we're going to keep it really um high level and or or just spe uh, specifically targeted toward some digestible um subjects one at a time so that so don't feel like uh you're going to be overwhelmed um i know we use spam the word spam but we're, we're just kidding with you there we're not going to really spam you um so please sign up for that and yeah we'll be happy to share uh some of the materials uh after the meeting we'll send them to the group all right so let's see here here's one here's a good one for you uh from jonathan um can you please elaborate on multifamily buildings and whether master or residentially metered makes a difference? Yes, that is a, a good question. And, and in general, it, it doesn't matter. The Any multifamily building that's 35,000 square feet or above is covered. Um, and the metering specifically just might adjust how for this is a little bit of a detail but for example if you have two buildings that are on a single meter though uh, and together they're over thirty-five thousand square feet those would be covered as one building because you can't separate the two they are one building uh that's kind of one of the finer details there so that's the only case where that master meter might make a difference uh is if you've got a bunch of buildings uh, that are all relative, you know, medium size, but but together. Uh, but otherwise, no, multifamily is covered uh, under the regulation. Great, thank you. And I like this one because this is probably a good point to kind of go back and talk about the timeline a little bit more in detail. Um, the question is, will there be opportunities for public comment in the future? And the answer to that is yes. And uh, Zach, can you walk us through what happened two weeks ago and when this gets published in the in the register and all that good stuff? Absolutely. So we released this public draft for kind of feedback right now, uh, and our uh, Air Quality Council reviewed it, and we're moving now towards a. Uh, a notice of proposed action is the official regulatory language, but essentially when we publish this in the Maryland Register uh, in the fall, uh, probably in about a month or so, we'll, we'll uh, exact dates, if you're signed up already for our newsletter, you'll get an email when it goes out. And that will be the moment when public comment opens. Public comment is open for uh, 30 days. And at the end of that public comment period, we'll hold a public hearing, we'll take additional comment at that point. And, and then from there, we'll close it out, uh, review those comments, and and uh, then kind of proceed from there. So we're anticipating public comment to directly answer the question. We're anticipating public comment uh, sometime in the early fall. Great, thank you. And uh, I have some more shameless plugs here. Um, there, there are lots of ways that you can get involved in that you can, I mean, I know you asked about public comment um, but there's a lot of other opportunities out there. We have several work groups and, 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 and bodies that meet regularly. And if you go to our website, mde.maryland.gov, and you click on the public outreach calendar, you can browse that way, or you can go to our commission on climate change. And there's all kinds of work groups, you know, anything from, you know, just transition to, uh, you know, a whole host of, I think there's seven or eight different work work groups for that commission. So lots of opportunities to, to get involved. So thank you for that question. All right, so I'll grab another one here for you, Zach. Um, I think we already did, is there a detailed covered buildings inventory available online? You already did that one, right? Yep. Um, the answer is yes. I'm going to click on how do I sorry maybe you could take one you see because I'm oh here we go oh I like this one because it's not a question um you cited biogas as an example of electricity generation that receives renewable subsidies you should qualify using biomethane as an example because most scientists do not consider it client clean non-harmful zero emission source of electricity so thank you, Andrew, for that comment. Duly noted. Um, let's see here. I know we have a couple more. Okay, this is 
is it Rosie? Rosie again? Um, is there an interim emission target for 2030 already determined? Yes. So, so there is uh, published in the draft proposed regulations. Uh, there is a uh, emissions an interim standard for the nearly 90 different building types. You know, per one per each building type for that interim period from 2030 to 2034, and from 2035 to 2039, uh, and the final standard in 2040 and beyond. And so you can find those if you go up in the links and you look at the uh, what we released, you can find those there. Um, uh, as we've been saying all along, the uh, we are going to evaluate all of these numbers after we get the first uh, two years worth of data from building owners. And then we're going to look back and make sure that everything kind of looks right and we're on the right track with those targets. But uh, absolutely, that's where you should be aiming for uh, if you uh, are trying to make changes uh, today because that's we're ultimately absolutely going to hit net zero direct emissions by 2040. We are required by the Climate Solutions Law, uh, Climate Solutions Now Act of 2022, the law to meet that. So we're absolutely going to be at zero by 2040. And uh, the interim standards are helping to push along the way and meet our requirements as well to have kind of 60% emissions reductions by 2031. So that that's where we're we're driving those interim standards from. Great. So uh, here's a good one, and, and you know now we're just going to try and stump Zach if we can. Uh, I don't think we can do it, but we can try. Um, the question is, how do I get data from my utility provider? That's a good one. And when do I do that? And before I let Zach answer that, we we have some of these. Um, some of these resources on our website too and, and actually in the next couple of weeks um, hopefully the end of this month or so we're going to have a uh, a full redesign of our of our website uh, when it comes to climate so all kinds of good stuff on there and we'll have some links to these uh, resources but go ahead zach how, how do we uh how do i interact with my utility company on this uh, yeah this is a, a very good question and something that every single building owner is going to be thinking about so We've been working very closely with the utilities and Maryland's Public Service Commission already to stand up the data, supplying data to building owners for BEPS purposes. And the way that'll look for some of the largest utilities, for example, you probably have heard of BGE uh, or EPCO, the, these big utilities, they're actually going to with the, you'll have a handshake with them. You'll go through some forms to have a handshake with them and say, yes, I own this building. Uh, please give me the data. And then they'll actually automatically deposit that data into your Energy Star Portfolio Manager account. And that's part of that handshake is saying, here, here's my account and here's my building or buildings. You know, please deposit. And so the kind of That'll be the easiest solution for a large majority of the buildings in Maryland. Uh, for some of the smaller utilities, uh, that will be that data is going to be provided in a spreadsheet format that can basically just be uploaded right into Portfolio Manager, a couple of clicks. Uh, again, all these details on how this works coming in September. Uh, you're getting a sneak peek tonight, and. Uh, but the, that's basically you'll request that spreadsheet and it'll keep coming. Um, uh, and, and that spreadsheet will help you get your data. Now, some of these are not stood up just yet because we're working towards uh, that going live next year in, in 2025 uh, to meet that June 1st deadline. But right now, if you want to start practicing some of the utilities, you can already get this data. Um, if you uh, if you look on their websites, you can find this data. Uh, or if you have your actual utility bills, you can take them and manually enter them in Portfolio Manager. Again, Portfolio Manager has a whole suite of trainings on how to do exactly this. So if you want to go out and start looking at that, or if not, wait a month and we'll have uh, some more guidance for you. Um, thank you. So uh, just a programming note, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, thank you for all the really good questions. And uh, we're still trying to stump Zach and haven't done it yet. So um, appreciate all your questions. And just a reminder that our next session will be all Q&A. So it'll be kind of a abridged version of this presentation. 
um, but focus more on the details and more on the questions that you all have. And certainly if you if you're aware of someone who couldn't make it tonight um, and, and you, you care to share how wonderful this presentation was with them, you can let them know that we'll be devoting even more time to answering questions in the next session. Um, so another question, Zach, how do we handle a building that is part of a solar park PPA? Well, Dave, you might have stumped me on this one. Oh, um, there we go. Good job, so Mr. Anonymous. I, I, uh, I, we'd have to honestly understand a little bit more what you mean by that. Probably if you're part of a PPA, again, generally PPAs are electricity. And so that's you know a credit on your electric bill. Again, because we're focused on direct emissions and electricity is out of scope for that direct emissions, you would not uh, account for that PPA electricity here, uh, but you're still consuming electricity and that math works out because you're still paying for every kilowatt hour you use, whether it's for the PPA or something else. So uh, I think uh, the answer to your question goes back to this renewable energy credits, but the uh, basically, you know, that is out of scope for the direct emissions standards that we're talking about here for right now. Uh, but if there's some more specific questions to that, I encourage you to reach out to our beps.mde at maryland.gov email with some more details, and we're happy to follow up with you on that specific question. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. Uh Here's one for you. What do you now? If I'm if I'm not mistaken here, uh, we have to. We are not permitted to prescribe, you know, specific things for exactly what you're supposed to do. But we can we can give you some general guidance. And, and the question is, uh, what do you suggest for building owners who have oil or gas boilers? Yes. Uh, obviously, this is a, a case for many buildings across Maryland, although a third of buildings are already meeting the standard, there are many that, that will need to make changes. And so our encouragement, and again, we're not allowed to prescribe changes, uh, specific things for your building, but at a high level, I can say, think about, uh, figure out when the end of life for your equipment is. Are you coming up for a recapitalization cycle? Are you coming up for major maintenance or replacement of that equipment in the next 15 years? If so, start planning today, do an energy audit, figure it out, and use that information to decide when you're going to make some changes. And so this is the kind of big thing that you might end up saying, well, it's time to replace that boiler anyway. Let's put a heat pump in instead, or put a variable refrigerant flow system, for example. If you're talking about a large building, like we probably are here, um, that might actually be cheaper in the long run uh, than especially an oil, uh, an oil bo boiler. Uh, but those specific questions, honestly, you're going to have to get feedback from a professional engineer who works with your specific building to tell you what makes sense. All that process kicks off with an energy audit. Start there and you'll be on the right path to making changes. And, and just for some illustrative purposes, I put this graphic back up on the screen so everybody can look at sort of a, a timeline based um, thing. So, you know, we just want to stress that there is a there is a significant runway here and there's there's time to plan, think ahead and do what makes the best sense for, for your property. And uh, we have a comment here from Jonathan Becker. Did you know that BGE, Delmarva, Pepco and Smeco offer a concierge service for incentives? Um, we can provide a list of who can support you for your Empower Incentive questions. So thanks for that, Jonathan. And uh, I would guess, you know, one place to start also might be to go to your utility provider's website and, um, you know, see what they see, what information they have there. But we're also happy to help. And you can certainly send us an email if you're if you're looking for some info and you can't find it. Dave, I've got another one here. That's that's a good one. Uh, someone asked, could you elaborate on campus compliance and when do I select that option? So this is a a special section of the BEPS uh, regulation for buildings that are on a campus. Uh, you can think about it, you know, University of Maryland College Park is an example of a campus, but there are other types of campuses as well. 
Uh, that will come up in 2025 as we start down this benchmarking journey. Uh, if you're going to if you're going to benchmark as a campus, uh, you'll have to submit a form uh, to say that I want to benchmark as a campus, and these are all the buildings on it, and this is why we're a campus, and meet the requirements of the regulation for for benchmarking as a campus. Uh, so coming up soon, uh, not just yet, uh, but uh, along with many of these other forms in, in the new year, that's uh, when we're planning to have that all live for you all to submit. And are you are you seeing this question about child child care properties? Uh, I'm not. OK. Uh, in Energy Star, I'm creating child properties under a campus profile. I'm assuming that means child care. No, that's separate. I know. I, I think I know where this is going. Okay. Um, will each of the buildings be evaluated for performance individually, or will it be evaluated as an entire campus? Could a more efficient building make up for a less efficient building on a campus? Uh, yeah, this is a good question. So if you're taking the campus compliance pathway, then you are looking at the campus as a whole, and we're developing a performance standard for the entire campus. Now, I will note, in the regulation and the technical manual, if you read it all, when you're in doing a campus specifically, you must do all buildings on that campus, not just those 35,000 square feet and above. That's because one of the reasons you might have a camp, you're doing campus compliance is you have a master meter for that entire campus or shared systems for that entire campus. So it's not that easy to pull out other buildings. And that's why we have that campus compliance option. Uh, but this is absolutely the case. You can use campus compliance to have a better performing building help one that's maybe hard, you know, performing a little worse. Uh, and so that's some of the options there. And in terms of the specific, uh, if you have these child properties, uh, when we're looking at the campus, you're going to submit it as, as that top level uh, main property. Uh, the specific details there, again, for those campus compliance folks, we're going to have a dialogue that's going to be a little bit more uh, detailed uh, on how that all works. So happy to deal with, to work with you on that later. Great. So we are almost at the top of the hour. Um, thank you all for the excellent questions. I think we've answered almost all of them. Um, I do have one or two left, so uh, we'll try and get to those. But uh, looks like we timed it perfectly and uh, appreciate everybody joining us tonight um, for this conversation. And uh, the question is, um, what if, and I guess this is sort of similar to the campus question, but if what if I what if I have a property that has multiple property types? Like what if I have an office space and a warehouse on the same property? I think I know what the answer is going to be to this, but what we got for that one, Zach? Yes, great question. So this is where we would use what's called an area weighted standard. And so I think I mentioned this at the beginning briefly. Uh, I might not, uh, sure, say you have a, an office with a little warehouse attached to the back, you would have a, uh, and the office is 100,000 square feet and the warehouse is 20,000 square feet, you know, those sections of your building. You would use the, uh, the standard would be weighted for uh, you know 100 square feet out of 120,000 square feet for the office standard and 20,000 out of 100,000 120,000 for the uh, warehouse and you add those together and you would get an area weighted standard if that made no sense to you go in the technical manual we actually have an example of how you do this calculation but Essentially, uh, we're going to set it up based on how much of the property is that, or how much of the building is that property type. Okay. Very good. We have just a couple minutes left. I think we've covered all the questions. Did you see any that I missed here, Zach? I think I, think I see one here. Uh, so someone asked uh, about what will MDE do with any received alternative compliance payments? This is a great question, uh, one we've gotten before. So MDE is uh, fairly strictly regulated by the legislature on what we have the authority to do in spending money. 
Uh, and so we don't actually have the authority to designate the specific use of that alternative compliance payment. Uh, uh, we are, uh, that goes into, you know, our general uh, alter uh, payments fund essentially from anyone in, in the state. So we're hoping to use that money uh, on uh, funding all these retrofits, but that's something we're working with the legislature on. Okay, and let's see, I'm being told that we missed one. It was Louisa, our first, the first person who joined us, Louisa, thank you. Um, she's asking about the accuracy of utility data in the, is it E star PM? Um, sorry, I have her full question. Uh, utilities putting data in EPM, suppose it's not accurate. We've had problems with the data they've been providing through BG's benchmarking tool. Is it accurate now? This is a, uh, yes, this is a concern we've heard as well from other folks. Um, uh, we are going to be, as I said earlier, we're working with the utility companies to ensure this data is accurate and we're going to be hopefully standing up a process here as as a result of all our working to help uh, resolve these issues and that's been a uh, kind of a, a a theme in Montgomery County as well where they've been benchmarking for many years now and they've worked really closely with there with the utilities to to solve these issues and so we're very optimistic it's many of the same utilities statewide and, and so uh, we're expecting to to pave that path over uh, and uh, make it a pretty smooth road uh, to bring that all together. And so that's uh, the kind of thing though, where uh, conversation with us, with the utilities will help if there are any concerns down the line. Uh, but again, we're working with the utilities. We've now met twice already, and we're gonna keep meeting and working with them to ensure that they are able to provide this data and provide it uh, accurately to building owners. All right. And and um, we'll also have a uh, a working group on that kind of reporting, uh, benchmarking and reporting on September 10th, if you want to find out any more about that. Very good. Very good. We're all for our plugs. Um, so thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, we're just approaching eight o'clock and uh, thank you for the great discussion. I uh, just wanted to remind you that of a couple of resources, of course, our website, um, you can go there and look around. Uh, you can read our climate plan. Please do so. There's a, a page devoted to building energy performance standards. Um, and uh, our YouTube page is a good resource, too, because there's, you know, all of our public bodies that meet and discuss these issues in great detail, that all of their meetings are posted on our YouTube page. So please take a look over there as well. And maybe there's one you'd like to join or participate in. And uh, we certainly welcome that. And, and you know, another thing, Zach, I noticed, you know, in a couple of the questions were, were very specific. And, uh, you know, we want to we wanna look at case studies too. We want to find some very specific examples that we can share with the public um, to illustrate kind of how this all works so that everybody can understand better you know what what they need to do and 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 how they can meet these standards and maybe maybe you could take us out with you know a, a wider lens view of like why does all this matter you know i mean what are we trying to do here we're talking about some pretty technical things but you know i think there's a there's a, a wider goal that you know perhaps is a good way good thing to end on yeah steve really great point i mean the goal for all of this is cleaner air for marylanders healthier homes and businesses for marylanders and and ultimately energy savings uh, for all marylanders that's what we're working towards here and meeting our climate pollution reduction goals uh figuring out how to make a more prosperous and better maryland for the future uh that's what we're working towards love it love it all right great well thank you everybody we're gonna uh, end the meeting now and uh, please go over to YouTube and um, look for it um, recorded and share it with all your friends. Have a great night. Appreciate it. Thanks to Sam and Zach.
And uh, we'll see you at the next meeting on uh, August 12th. Have a good night.